And I think a lot of people, they end up using cannabis or psilocybin or any of these things, and they think, wow, that makes me better. So in order to be better, I must have to use more and more of it. When in reality, these medicines are here to illuminate for us what is already possible in our lives past the limitations that we have programmed into our subconscious. A lot of what we focus on in the program is understanding that with great power comes great responsibility. And so to take radical ownership over your life and over your relationship with, say, cannabis in this instance is to understand that this plant is not showing you anything that you cannot access without it. But at the same time, mm. it can illuminate for you what is potentially standing in the way of you being able to create the life of your dreams and be able to, in your sober state of reality, be high on life. And so a lot of what separates a conscious relationship from an unconscious relationship is the intention. Welcome to Max Wellness. Today's guest is Ryan Sprague, cannabis coach, expert, teacher, and cultivator. He tells us about his interesting journey and how he became a cannabis coach, teaching people how to connect and use this plant as a tool rather than a substance that can become detrimental to one's health, which is something I see very frequently as a health practitioner. Needless to say, I found this discussion very interesting and I hope you do too. Of course, this is not medical advice in any way. Talk to your medical professional before attempting anything thing that's mentioned in this episode. Thank you. Well, welcome, Ryan. I'm super happy to have you uh, with me. Um, I came across your work and yourself uh, from many podcasts that I listened to, the Holistic OBGYN podcast, also from Paul Check, and also um, recently on Aubrey Marcus's podcast. So uh, congratulations for that. And from there, I really wrote you a message on Instagram. I was like, wow, I, I find your work very refreshing. Uh, the message that you're bringing about cannabis and how to use it in a conscious slash healthy way and mm. we hopped on to a networking call where i was like whoa we should have uh, recorded that so we're like okay <laughs> let's uh schedule a little uh, podcast episode together so i'm glad we're here basically the intention of, of today's podcast is really to uh for the listeners to understand i would say how to interact with cannabis if they wish to um, interact with it uh mm. of course it's not a medicine that's for everyone um but then again if they choose Used to in a conscious and healthy way because uh here especially here in canada since it's been legal it's been more popular than ever <laughs> uh to a broad <laughs> spectrum of people but i find that there is uh less education than ever especially also as the um holistic health practitioner in the clinic mm. it's used for either recreationally, uh, but also uh, sometimes um, for, for specific ailments. Uh, but when used in an unhealthy or unconscious way, I find that many times it does more harm than good. So when I, I heard you speak and the way you, you talk about it, you know, I was like, okay, I need to have a discussion with this guy. So uh, briefly for our listeners, can you um, give us a brief history of your journey, I would say, uh, until now today where you came out with like this whole uh, program actually on how and a course on how to connect in a conscious way with cannabis? Yeah, man. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. You know, when we connected, I was like, man, you're charging my battery. I'm charging yours. This is great reciprocity, <laughs> you know, and it's just so amazing to be able to share my story regarding cannabis, because like you said, you know, there's a lot of, we were talking about this briefly before we hit record, but there's a lot of sacred cows in the cannabis industry. And I like to burn every one of those cows. And really what I mean by that is, you know, when you get into, you know, I worked in the industry for years and I'll get into a little bit before that too, but you know, you hear all these things like, oh, well, you can just smoke it all day. It won't give you cancer. You know, it's, they can't do any harm. And that's just completely not true. And I know that because I've also been in that category before. And I thought that I wasn't going to get there uh, because I was playing by all the rules. And I'll get into that. But, you know, really my story started when I was 16. And I was experiencing a lot of what I would call now generalized anxiety disorder. And, you know, I tried every pharmaceutical under the sun. Uh, went to a doctor, you know, told them what was going on, and they did their best with the information that they had available, but it just didn't work for me. And at that point, I had seen people interacting with cannabis, and I was taking the Nancy Reagan approach of just saying no. And, you know, it was at a last ditch effort at the recommendation of a friend who, when you're 16, you know, it's not like the most mature conversation, but basically I was telling him that I was experiencing anxiety. And I don't know how I said it then, but that was the general gist of it. And he was like, well, man, you should try cannabis for that. And I was like, what? 
because that was the first time I had ever been exposed to the idea of cannabis being medical of any you know way, shape, or form. So I ended up trying it. And it took me a couple times to get that effect. You know, you're not really sure when you first interact with something like, am I, you know, it's like with alcohol, right? Like, am I drunk? Am I not? Like, what am I supposed to be feeling? So it takes you a couple times. But the first time that I really got the experience, I felt so much more connected to myself. And really what happened was I realized that I was not my thoughts. And to have that realization at 16 in America, right, a Western society culture was really profound. And I didn't exactly know what I had figured out. But I knew that all of a sudden I was separate from the anxiety I was experiencing. And it wasn't so, you know, uh, cumbersome anymore. And so I continued experimenting. But this is where it gets shaky because, like you were saying, there's no education out there specifically speaking to how to interact with the plant consciously. You can find out what THC is. You can find out what CBD is. You can find out research studies. You can figure out how to grow. But, like, that's more consulting work, right? No one's coaching you on whether or not cannabis is helping you or hurting you in your life, how much to use, how to know if it's, you know, actually becoming a challenge in your life. And so luckily I got to run my own little science experiment because it really came in handy now at this point where by 18, I was smoking every day. I wasn't smoking all day, but I was smoking a good amount of the day. And I woke up one morning and went to the bathroom and peed blood. And I was terrified. Mm. I had no idea what was happening. And it had nothing to do with cannabis. Uh, it ended up being a benign cyst on my kidney that had broken open. And at this point, I was pretty unhealthy. I was like most 18-year-olds. You know, I was smoking cigarettes. I wasn't really drinking too much, but I was eating terrible food, not drinking water. So that was like my mortality crisis. And on the way to the hospital, my dad drove me. And my dad was someone who he didn't partake in anything at that point in his life. He had had his partying days, but he never interacted with cannabis. He was always more of a drinker. And so he had always kind of just told me, like, just don't do it, right? But he wasn't, like, vehemently against it or anything. He was just kind of like, eh, you know, I'm just going to look the other way. So he had an idea that I might be using it, but he didn't know specifically. And so when we were going to the hospital, he asked me in a panic. He was like, I got to ask, are you doing drugs? And I was like, no, but I am smoking a lot of cannabis. And so I saw him have, like, a sigh of relief. Like, oh, okay. And I was like, interesting. So we go to the hospital. And I'm in there for, I think, five days, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. Like I said, it was just a benign cyst, because a lot of times I forget to say what it was, and then people were like, what was it? Why were you peeing blood? So I wanted to make sure I said that. (laughs) But when I was there, I brought my laptop in, because I was bored as hell. There was nothing else to do. And so my dad would hang out with me. Um, My mom did too, but my dad would be there a lot when she was going to work and stuff. And so I got to show him a lot of the videos that I had been watching. Um, You know, like one is from Dr. William Courtney named Leaf in which he found, he was, you know, he's a doctor. And so he was working with a patient who had something like 11 different autoimmune disorders. And she was essentially on death's doorstep. And he started juicing cannabis leaves. So no psychoactivity or intoxication whatsoever, just getting the THCA, which is the unadulterated version of Delta 9 THC. And he started juicing this for her and put every single one of her disorders into remission with just cannabis juice. And then they ended up getting married at the end. It's a really cool story. But But I started showing him these things, and to my surprise, he had no cognitive dissonance about it. He was just like, wow, well, I guess I didn't know what I didn't know. And hey, if this is helping you, like, we really connected. I was telling him, like, the reason I use this is for anxiety. You know, at that point, I wasn't aware that maybe I was using it for some other things to numb out and things like that, because I was terrified of, I was in school for psychology at that point, didn't exactly know what I wanted to do with it, you know, the typical things of an 18-year-old. And so he was like, well, hey, I know you went through a big challenge with anxiety, you uh, are going to school, you have a job, you're paying your bills, you know, you're an adult. If this works for you, I'd rather you do that than pharmaceuticals anyway. And so I was like, okay. So at that point, he allowed me to start, you know, using cannabis and not hiding it anymore and these kind of things. And so about, I would say, uh, a couple of years later, medical passes here in Massachusetts. And so I'm able to get my medical card. I'm learning a lot more about cannabis and psychology at the same time in school. And uh, we try growing our own cannabis, my dad and I, you know, his business was going through a really big uh, hiccup after the recession, and he needed a good hobby to get his mind off of it. So I was like, hey, buy us a kit because I was a broke college student, and we'll grow a couple plants. It'll be fun. And so eventually I wore him down. He was like, okay, fine, I'll buy you this kit. So we buy this kit. I'm all excited. We buy our seeds from the United Kingdom because at that point you couldn't buy them in America. And uh, we plant some plants and the first harvest was terrible. It was absolutely atrocious, right? Like I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying to thug it out and wing it. And so 
Around that same time that I harvested, I went to this local meetup called the Boston Freedom Rally, which is we have the Boston Commons in the middle of Boston. It's like this big green area. And every year they host a public uh, display of disobedience where everyone comes there. It's been happening for years and they smoke cannabis on the green with the cops there. And as long as you're not doing anything too crazy, they usually don't you know, mind you too much. And so I go there, I'm walking around and I hear someone yelling, who wants to make butter with me? And so I'm like, well, I like to make cannabis butter. I imagine that's what he's talking about. So I go over to his little booth and he's handing out these pamphlets of this cannabis school, this institute opening up right near my house. And so I was like, this is crazy. Like, cause I thought I'd have to go to, you know, at this point, cannabis was still so new out here in terms of like a legal industry. There was no dispensaries yet. It took four years from when medical passed to actually have dispensaries. Luckily they allow us to grow or they allowed us to grow. And uh, so we were able to like, you know, supply ourselves if we were medical patients. But, you know, at that point, like I thought I'd have to go to California to go to Oaksterdam, which was the only school available then. So I end up going home. I tell my dad, I'm like, could you pay my tuition of this? You know, it wasn't too much. It was like 500 for the semester, but I was a broke college student. So he goes, yeah, and I'll do you one better. I'll go with you because I'm really excited to like get into your world. You know, he was always excited to like, you know, he would go to metal shows with me when I was a kid. It must have been so awkward for him and cringy, but he went with me all the time. He was so <laughs> supportive of everything I did. You know, he bought me all the guitars I wanted and I always would have music lessons and things like that. So he goes to the school with me. Nice. We have a blast. You know, he's like, you know, where I got a lot of my socialness from. So he's teaching me a lot when I'm there, just like how to network and you know, he's like, you got to be the first one in last one out. You're serious about this, like, like show them, you know? And so, so I start going there. Cause at that point I realized I didn't want to wear khakis the rest of my life. So I didn't want to be a typical therapist. <laughs> so I knew I had to figure something out. And so I start going there. I start falling in love. I start learning a lot more. My harvests get a lot better. And so I end up interning there working for them and I'm really feeling like on my path. And then in 2014, I go to a music festival. I interact with my first uh, other plant medicine, and it's not really a plant medicine, but it was MDMA, and uh, and I feel this heart opening feeling, and I just you know in the middle of the crowd, I'm having this wild experience, you know, because I had always been very careful, like I didn't want to interact with anything that was going to hurt my brain or whatever, and so I did a lot of research beforehand and looked into what Maps was doing. I was like, okay, so long as I know it's clean, I'll try this once, and so I did it. My heart was very open, and in the middle of the crowd, I could just feel this feeling. That had to do with my father. I just knew there was something going on. But at that age, I didn't know how to like, you know, actually articulate that and like explain it. And so when I got home from that music festival, about nine days later, I found out my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer and that he wasn't going to mm -hmm. take treatment. And so here's, you know, my best friend going through this cancer treatment and uh, or this cancer diagnosis. And, you know, it was crazy because he had just finished up bringing his brother for three years to Dana Farber in Boston for cancer treatment. And he had watched what chemo and radiation had done to his brother. And he just didn't want to go out that way. You know, he had his dignity. He had a great head of hair, even at 64. And so he was like, listen, I'm going to go out the way I want to go out. And he smoked cigarettes. He didn't eat well. He drank Coca cola but he was my dad. And so I loved him for who he was. And I decided to you know, continue loving him for the man he was and not try to make him into who I thought he should be to be able to survive and, you know, tell him, drink this, do that. You know, I figured I would just, you know, connect with him deeper. But what I realized was that I was having a real big challenge connecting with him and not making him seem like, because he didn't want people to be like, you know, oh, you're dying. You know, he didn't want that. Mm -hmm. He wanted to just be himself. And so I found that challenge of like, how do I interact with this guy? Like everything's normal. And so after a couple of weeks, I didn't know at that point that I'd only given him two months to live. Uh, he never told me that. Uh, I found out later on. But uh, he started experiencing some pain because when he got diagnosed, I mean, he was experiencing some stuff for sure that he used to like double over in pain. And I'd be like, what is that? And he'd be like, it's nothing. It's nothing. And so like he was definitely experiencing some pain already. But it got to a point where he was like, OK, I need to do something. And so we had learned a lot about RSO, Rick Simpson Oil. Uh, Rick yeah. Simpson is the gentleman that brought this type of extract into the mainstream. It's also it's more professional name is called FICO, full extract cannabis oil. And we had learned a lot about how THC can kill cancer cells. CBD can inhibit their growth. And for anyone listening who wants to look this up, you can go on PubMed. You can find these studies. Uh, this is not just me talking out of my ass here. And so we decided, screw it, we're going to try it. And so we made the last harvest that we grew together completely into RSO. And I started administering it to him. And because he had never 
interacted with cannabis, at least not in like 40 years, you know, I was sitting with him when he was interacting with this because it's like almost like imagine if you've never smoked cannabis and then you're smoking or interacting and eating the strongest version of cannabis out there. And when you're eating yeah. cannabis, it's also getting metabolized by the liver and turning into something called 11-hydroxy THC, which research shows is between one and seven times more intoxicating than Delta-9 THC. So you're like having the full rocket ship experience. So I'm sitting with him and, you know, it's funny. He's laughing. He's asking me questions about like what I think happens after you die. And it was just like this beautiful experience of being able to connect with my father in a way that we had never connected before. I got to hear stories wow. about his childhood. I got to uh, watch him, you know, create closure with his other kids, with his grandchildren, with my mother and with his own mortality. And so it was in that experience that I really realized that cannabis was much more than I had learned already. I knew it could connect me to myself because I had experienced it with my anxiety, but I never knew it could connect me more to the people I love in my life. And especially, you know, at a time like that. And so, you know, after that, I realized, okay, I really want to make this my life. And, and I was really passionate about it. And so my father ended up passing um, a year past when they had given him that he was going to uh, live. And so I got an extra year with my father that I don't know if I would have gotten uh, if it weren't for cannabis and, you know, his tumors did shrink, uh, you know, they never stopped growing, but they, they, they essentially like slowed down a lot and he was getting scans to, you know, corroborate this. And so, you know, through that time after he passed, I ended up getting into the dispensary, uh, working as a patient care advocate with over 5,000 patients in the five years I was there coaching them on holistic health and everything else to do with cannabis. Like, Hey, it's great that you're finding cannabis works, but are you drinking enough water? Are you sleeping well? Are you using blue light blockers? Right? So like, it was pretty mm -hmm. funny. You know, here's this dispensary, people in there. And, you know, people are like, I want to go see that guy because I want to know what my diet's like, you know. And so it was really fun. And, you know, I also uh, worked there as a cultivator, too. And so at a certain point, I realized that, you know, we got bought out by another company that uh, it just wasn't in alignment with my values, how they were running the dispensary. So it was a great opportunity in disguise because, you know, it, it really fueled me to start my own business. And so in 2019, after a wild uh, awakening, as I would call it, which we can get into if you want, I ended up deciding that, you know, I needed to quit my job. And I also realized in that awakening, I uh, was actually another experience with MDMA, that I was interacting with cannabis unconsciously. And at this point, hmm. you know, I was only interacting with it once per night. I was using a vaporizer. You know, I was playing by all the rules. That's what I meant earlier, right? I was like, it was a big shock to me. But what I realized was that I had wanted to live, leave this job for a while. I felt this potential building in me, this hero's journey turning on. And yet I had never given myself the time to really like express it because I would get all the motivation and frustration necessary to make a change during the day when I was at my job. And I would come home and numb out with cannabis unconsciously to forget about my day. And then I would not take any action to figure out what I was going to do. And then I would go back to the job the next day. And it was just this cyclical process. And so once I realized this, I took a three month break from cannabis, started highly optimized, quit the job. And uh, then I ended up getting back into cannabis because I didn't know if I was ever going to use cannabis again at that point, because I thought, oh, cannabis did this to me. But then what I realized mm -hmm. was, no, I did this. I'm going to take radical ownership. It's not the cannabis plant that caused this issue. It's me. And so it was my opportunity to start creating discipline and structure in my life. And so over the last three years, I've been practicing and learning from indigenous cultures and really practicing on myself as my own science experiment of how to do this. And that's where the Connect with Cannabis program was born. Because when I got into coaching, you know, I thought I'd leave psychology behind, not forever, but, you know, kind of a hobby. And then I got into coaching and I was like, wow, this is what I always wanted my psychology stuff to be, right? Because therapy just wasn't exactly what was, you know, in alignment with me. And so I would be going around to all these, you know, coaches and these different meetups and whatnot. And I'd be telling them what I'm doing with coaching. And then I'd mention the cannabis and they're like, yeah, it's cool. You're coaching, but tell me more about this cannabis stuff. I'm having some troubles with that. You know, like, how do you interact with it? And so literally it just started happening that everyone was asking me about it. So about, you know, two years ago, my business partner and I, we were like, you know, are we meant to make a cannabis program? And the second we asked the question, you know, I made the intention, I sat with cannabis and just all the downloads started coming. And literally we built the program and we wrote it out anyway in two days. And then it took us about six months to build it out. And, um, you know, now we're on to our second program, Grow With Cannabis, which is all about how to cultivate a sacred relationship with cannabis and uh, the food supply really by cultivating organically with biogeometry, Korean natural farming. And so it's been a wild journey, man, of following my heart. And cannabis has been a huge uh, teacher and ally in me being able to find my heart and just, you know, believe in it beyond all logic. It's amazing. <laughs> 
I love it. And I love it. And I, that's why I always ask this question about the journey of um, my guests, because I'm a fan of uh, knowing how they get, because all my guests, I, I will say, are uh, really like, uh, have like this beautiful, you know, like well-guided uh, path. I believe we all do, mm. uh, if we want to see it that way. <clears throat> and I, I love how uh, there's so much uh, to unpack here and uh, from what you just said, but even like from the start, when you said that uh, your first experiences with cannabis, they got you to um, connect more with yourself and uh, to your emotion and that you're not your thoughts and all these things. And that's not necessarily very typical. I, I remember my, my first time, sometimes it would, it would literally like scare me, you know, like, but sa same thing. It got me to, to my thoughts. It's kind of like an amplifier. I would say I, I was a young teenager also. And, um, I love how you say like it got you to connect with yourself and at some point later in your life, you were using it to disconnect more, which was a re realization that you got to at some point throughout the years. Uh, but this is what I would love to, to uh, you know, like uh, emphasize, but also like to develop on like that. It's a slippery slope. And uh, sometimes, you know, be with anything, really, any external uh, substance or any external thing, it could be watching in Netflix, it could be anything, really. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a tool. It can be a tool to connect with yourself or to disconnect. Yeah. And then, you know, it can get tricky depending on how you use it and whatever you tell yourself. So I, I find this very interesting. What would you say... Um, shifted uh, from when you started using it, you know, like in a more unconscious way. Mm. Actually, you talk about a lot about conscious cannabis use. So uh, yeah. could you elaborate more on what a conscious use is from your definition? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the first thing I'll get into is like, you know, I think for a lot of people, they just, you know, I, I'll speak for myself. I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I think that the main reason we made Connect with Cannabis is because we realized that for being the world's most popular plant medicine and the world's most misunderstood plant medicine, there's no guidance out there, right? If you want to learn about psilocybin mushrooms, you can look at John Hopkins research. If you want to learn about MDMA, you can go to maps, right? Like you can look into LSD studies with, you know, Stan Groff. I mean, you can look into these things, but where's all the info on cannabis, right? The one that's being used more than anything else. And, and it's really interesting because, you know, what I, what I've noticed in hindsight was that the reason that I was disconnecting with it and choosing not to connect was because I didn't feel like I had the power to change my reality and create the life of my dreams. And this is why like a mm. lot of what we focus on and connect with cannabis is not just cannabis, but also it's like, how can this plant help you create an architect, the life of your dreams and help you have the direct experience that you are the creator of your own reality? Because I think that, you know, a lot of people have said this, and I think the more you're into spirituality, the more you'll understand this, depending on who's listening. But we have been led to believe that we are so much less powerful than we are. And I think a lot of people, they end up using cannabis or psilocybin or any of these things, and they think, wow, that makes me better. So in order to be better, I must have to use more and more of it. When in reality, these medicines are here to illuminate for us what is already possible in our lives past the limitations that we have programmed into our subconscious and into our being. And so I think that a lot of what we focus on in the program is understanding that with great power comes great responsibility. And so to take radical ownership over your life and over your relationship with say cannabis in this instance, in this example, you know, is to understand that this plan is not showing you anything that you cannot access without it. But at the same time, mm. it can illuminate for you what is potentially standing in the way of you being able to create the life of your dreams and be able to, in your sober state of reality, be high on life. And so a lot of what separates a conscious relationship from an unconscious relationship is the intention. You know, when you're interacting with a plant consciously like cannabis, you're specifically going, I have a challenge I'm experiencing and I want to be illuminated as to what is blocking me. So for instance, maybe you have a creative block in your life and you just can't figure it out. And like Albert Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same level of thinking that created it. So you decide to check out for a second and dissociate, right? And be able to illuminate for with cannabis, what might be standing in the way. So maybe you have this creative block and you uh, interact with cannabis and you discover the plant shows you that you've been really like part of you has been calling to paint more. 
right? Maybe you painted in the past and you just miss painting a lot. And so what a lot of people do is they go, oh my God, that was amazing. I felt so high when, you know, cannabis showed me that. And then they come out of the experience, they do not integrate. And therefore they're not really using a medicine. They're using a substance, first of all, which no judgment, mm. but it's just a difference that needs to be said. But second of all, they're going to end up mistaking the medicine for the thing that's going to make them feel the high they felt when they realized they needed the paint in this example. When on the other side, in a conscious relationship, you set that intention of like, I am ready to make a change in my life and I want to see what's blocking me, let's say creatively. You go in, you see this paint thing. And the great thing about cannabis is that if you're dosing it properly, you still have one foot on the ground. So you can integrate while you're still in the experience. You know, if you're on a strong dose of psilocybin and you get this download to paint, right? It's really hard to go on your phone and set up a paint class right then. But when you're on cannabis, <laughs> right? The people psychedelic, as I call it, and I can get into why I think it and why I describe it like that. But, you know, you can actually open up your phone and take action right then on integrating that into your life. Sign up for a paint class, go on Amazon and buy a paint kit, right? You can like actually start making changes because the plant won't do the work for you. It will illuminate what might need to be done like the way I say it is it will show you the what, but your end of the bargaining is figuring out the how. And I think that's where a lot of people get mistaken in cannabis. And so the three-step process I have that I would love to go down real quick to, for anyone listening who's interested in what I'm saying, and they're like, okay, I interact with cannabis. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm buying what you're selling. Let's try this out. You know, I want to see what happens. So the first step is what we call taking your power back. And in that, it's actually realizing that you have power in the experience. But the idea is taking your power back through a combination of setting an intention and creating a ceremony surrounding your cannabis sessions. And so what that might look like is once again, I'm experiencing a creative block and I would like to be illuminated as to what is standing in my way from feeling creative in my day-to-day -day life. And then, so you write that down, you verbalize it right before you interact with cannabis and what you would have done beforehand is set up a ceremonial space. So what this could look like is this is like the setting part of your set and setting, right? I think intention is part of what the set is, right? Like your mindset. But when you get into the setting, it's like having a comfortable space where you feel safe. And also a space where if you have a real legitimate question for cannabis, probably not the best setting to do it at a concert, right? Because you can't, it's too much interference, right? Too many cooks in the kitchen. You can't actually, because cannabis I find whispers, right? Like the mind yells, cannabis whispers. It might be like, look at that, right? Or like, go here. And so you want to be able to have a space that's calm, that's safe. And what you might want to do, and there's many different ways to do this, but you might want to cleanse yourself with sage first, and then reintegrate your the energy in your space with Palo Santo, and then do a seven directional prayer, and then be able to actually lay down and go through a body scan, where you actually start tuning into what sensations in your body, breathing in is the acceptance and breathing out is letting go, right? So as you're feeling these tensions or, you know, tight spots in your body, you're breathing through it and you're waiting for a message of some sort. Now that message could come through as a legitimate, like actual clear audience message where you actually just hear like painting. It could come through as a picture of a paint kit. It could come through as an intuitive knowing. It could come through as a memory, right? Of you painting and how excited you were as a kid to paint and how free you felt. So it can come through in a lot of different ways. But one of the things that cannabis does is it opens up our psychic senses, our intuitive nature. And so clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, intuitive knowing. And again, you don't need cannabis to do that, but it can do that if you're currently on, like you don't know how to get there. And so it can be a great teacher in that way. But then once you've done that and you've taken your power back, you've set your intention, you're in the right space, you can then move into the second part, which is what the body scan kind of dives into, which is the surrendering, the letting go. And surrender for a lot of people is a trigger term, right? And I get it. They don't want to let go of control. But what I found is that, you know, in working with hundreds of clients in the program too, is that the, a lot of the times the reason surrender is scary is because they don't know why they're surrendering or what they're surrendering into. That is what your intention provides. It shows you why you would surrender. Because again, you can't solve the problem from the same level of thinking that created it. If you are not willing to surrender, well, then you shouldn't be interacting with a plant medicine because you're inviting another essence into you to teach you. And so if you're not willing to actually subtract from the equation of yourself and allow space from which that spirit can work through you, then you're just not ready to interact with a plant medicine. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's many other rivers that can get you to the same, you know, sea, if you will, meditating, breath work, working with a coach, et cetera. And then once you've done that and you've gotten your message, well, the third step is being able to become unstoppable, as we call it. And so that is the whole concept of integration, right? And once again, if you're not integrating, 
you're not using a medicine, you're using a substance. And once again, it's no big deal how you choose to interact with it. Everyone's a sovereign being. But if you are intending to use it as a teacher, a medicine and an ally, it is imperative that you integrate. It's not an optional thing. And so integration is where you take that, you know, P-E-A-K peak experience and you integrate it into your life so you can begin having P-E-E-K peak experiences, which is where your daily life starts to become psychedelic in nature. And what I mean by psychedelic mm -hmm. is not that you're having tracers and visuals and things are melting, <laughs> but you start having synchronicities, you start having serendipities. Life just starts being so magical that you just feel like you're living in a dream because you're starting to wake up to your true authentic self. You're starting to wake up to your potential and you're starting to actually put it into action. You're starting to believe in yourself. You're starting to actually tune into the idea that you are the creator of your reality, that you can do anything you set your mind and heart to. And so once you've gone through that three-step process, you're in a much better spot to become conscious in your relationship. And I'll give you for the show notes, we have a conscious cannabis guide that people can download that goes into these steps a little bit more in depth and also the three ways to understand awesome. the language in which cannabis speaks because that's the other half of this as well. Well, I find this, again, so much to unpack here, but so, so interesting because as you said, like the pitfall or as uh, I believe it was Terrence McKenna mm. that said that, uh, correct mm. me if I'm wrong, but like uh, you, once you get the message, you can hang up the yes. phone for a while, you know, so you go through that experience and then you can, for, for example, like the, the very common saying, you know, everything is more fun on cannabis, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to go uh, do the laundry, uh, <laughs> clean my house or any other activity, watch a movie. But then again, it, it brings a lot of presence or whatever it brings to mm -hmm. you. You can bring that back after the <laughs> trip or uh, the experience, yes. I would say, not necessarily a trip, but, uh, and, and then, you know, like integrate it into your daily life or see like what made it that much more fun. You know, there's definitely like a neurotransmitter part, but also like what does this, the, this shift in my neurophysiology bring to me and how can I bring it back into my daily life? You know, I think that this is where the pitfall, uh, becomes uh there you know uh, oh i need some more cannabis to enjoy stuff more and then you're into this vicious cycle i would say and then uh as you mentioned i, I believe in another podcast <laughs> uh you know you go through like a, what you cannot stop for three days has control over yes. you you know so i think that that might be a cue when any substance really any external thing whether it's your your you know, mobile phone, mm -hmm. whether it's watching Netflix, whether it's uh, social Exercise. media, whether it's any other substance. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So I think that's a, a good um, reality check to have with anything, really. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a big one with cannabis. And also, as you mentioned, it, it is, uh, I don't know if you agree with me on that one, but like it is a psychedelic. It is 100%. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with okay. you. Yeah. And, um, you know, like it's, uh, kind of like with any substance, you, you don't want to, there's, I believe some exceptions to that, uh, like cancer patients for like very specific yes. ailments where like higher doses on like a more chronic mm -hmm. use could be beneficial for like symptom management. Yes. Uh, but for other ways, I think like, a it can do more harm than good. Yes. So uh, I think it's a very uh, slippery slope, but I, I find this very, that's why I find this very refreshing what you're bringing with your message. Um, especially I'm like with teenagers who are like uh, exper experimenting with it, like for their first time when they get like a, a, of legal age, uh, if they don't use it in a, a conscious way they can not only get a traumatizing experience yeah. and uh like you said if you do it like in a concert in in a set and setting with psychedelics are very important not only to traumatize yourself but you know like to have even negative consequences that can be in some cases um traumatizing and lasting so yeah. uh, it, it's definitely not for everyone i'm not saying like Everybody go uh, buy some <laughs> cannabis and try to, um, you know, like experiment to, to, to address some psychological issues. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely talk to your health practitioner. This is where I, I do my disclaimer yes. as a health practitioner. Just talk to your health practitioner. Definitely get some counseling. But then again, if you're curious and you have the okay from your health professional, if you're curious to experiment with cannabis, these are some great uh, guides or places where you can start yeah. for sure. Um, from there, it's not if you're not drawn to it, stay. It's a tool as meditation, breath work. And I love how you um, talked about breath work because many times, you know, uh, 
I find that if you distract yourself, let's say you're in a concert and you interact with cannabis, uh, or it gets overwhelming. I I've had those experiences mm -hmm. uh, when I was younger and like with <laughs> higher doses, uh, unfortunate experiences. And the key would be to distract myself and keep me okay and not, not to be too, too overwhelmed. But if you try and do it to have some um, insights or to uh, explore, to interact with it with it in a conscious way, if your set and setting is not right and you're, if you're too distracted, like you said, you're going to miss the whispers. Yes, 100%. And, uh, it's, um, because I have a similar story to, to, to you in a way, I would say like uh, the most of my interaction with cannabis was more when I was in my teenagers, I would say. And, um, uh, late teenage, I would say my, my late teenage crisis, <laughs> uh, late teenage in the maybe early twenties, but, uh, I would interact it, with it more to suppress my emotions mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, and like, it's a very soothing, um, a uh, plant, so like a kind of like a mothering, yeah, a soothing energy, I would say. Yeah. And uh, I was going through what I now uh, can say was like anxiety from, you know, like being in a university, very intense program and not being sure what I was doing there. Should I continue? And like all those anxieties of being away from home. And um, basically, after that, like uh, I just completely let it go for, for many years. And then it became legal in, in Canada. And uh, I started experimenting here and there, uh, definitely in a different way and not as a unhealthy way back then. I was smoking and all these things, like you said, like the vaporizing thing, it's very different than vaping with those liquids. It's more of a dry, yes. herb, um, how would you say, uh, uh, kind of like he it heats it up. How would you describe uh, the the like let's say a volcano or a vaporizer? Yeah. It, it just heats it up to this point where uh, you get vapor as opposed to any burning, so you don't get as much like carbon dioxide and all those uh, harmful chemicals from the smoke of smoking. And it's a, a cleaner way I would say to interact with it. But the key is here is not to do it on a daily basis or like overdo it yeah. for sure. <laughs> and, um, I would say when I found, I stumbled up, up on your podcast, like a, a few months ago, and I was going through a similar experience with my mother, uh, mm -hmm. passing and, uh, she had passed for like a month or two. And then I, I set an intention after listening to one of your podcasts and I went to walk with the dog and, uh, just to show me what you want to show me. That was what was, uh, in the, the specific podcast. Yeah. Episode. And then I came back, uh, and I, like I saw my girlfriend, I, I burst out, you know, like crying so much grief that I hadn't processed from my mother's, uh, passing. I was expecting a newborn. There was so much stuff going on in my life. I hadn't given myself the full space and, uh, to, to really fully express. So I just, uh, burst into tears in the arms of my, uh, my partner. And it was a beautiful experience, actually the complete opposite of, you know, suppressing my emotions. It really brought to my consciousness, what was, you know, like being avoided. Uh, so to me, it was radical, yeah. <laughs> like the, the way of fusing it in a more ceremonial, intentional way. It's crazy the difference. Oh, it's amazing. Know? And then again, after with the coupled with some journaling and all those, it helps. Could I have gotten there like meditating or with breath work or any other like sound therapy? Most mm -hmm. likely. Uh, I mean, uh, I use many of those modalities, but in that situation, it, that's what came up, you know? So it's just to show people or to, to put into context how it could be used in a very, uh, unconscious weight can become more detrimental to your well-being, whether it's physical, psychological, emotional health, or it could become a tool if people choose to interact with that can be very interesting to explore it, but you got to see it as such. And by, you know, like you said, you, like when you go with, on psilocybin or all those other psychedelics, uh, people are, are much more intentional. They use it in ceremony with much more, I would say, respect as opposed to, um, cannabis has this kind of like a tag of like a party, uh, hippie, you know, the, the whole, the old like mm -hmm. archetype of, uh, smoking a joint and doing other <laughs> things. Um, so I think 
brings me back to how refreshing I find your message. And I think it's uh, much needed uh, for people, especially now that it's becoming a very widespread. Um, yeah. Use. I mean, yeah, so. you know, you, 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 you just said yeah. a lot of what, you know, I feel very strongly about, you know, I mean, these emotions, right? Like our world is very busy and, you know, a hundred, 200 years ago, you could meditate for on a mountaintop, right? And go do that if you wanted to. And you could get to a lot of places. And I'm not saying you can't get there today, but a lot of times we're in such a left brain dominant society now that it takes a lot of time to break through the confines of the programming we have. And a lot of times, like when we look at the world right now, you know, the studies say that we have about 10 years to get our shit together before the world is basically damaged beyond repair. And so we need healing now. We need to be able to connect deeper to ourselves first now so that we can connect deeper to the world around us because, you know, I'm a big student of hermetic laws. And this is some of what I do in the modern mystery school. And so the law of correspondence states as within, so without, as above, so below. And so like Ram Dass said, the best thing I can do for me is work on me. The best thing I can do for you is work on me. And cannabis puts the power back into the people because unlike psilocybin and these other things, right? And I'm not saying you cannot interact with these other psychedelics without a guide. You know, I always recommend it. But at the same time, cannabis is something that if you learn to dance with it, you can do so even without a guide. And I always recommend having a guide, but let's face it, right? We don't live in a perfect world. Some people can't afford that. They don't have access to it. But here's this plant, right? That if used in an intentional way, if this message gets out to enough people, we start to have that tipping point where people start being able to heal themselves. And when they heal themselves, they're not hurt people anymore. And you know what hurt people do? They hurt people. You know what healed people do? They heal people. And I believe that we're all healers in mm -hmm. disguise, right? You know, a lot of times we think about these beautiful right. modalities like plant medicines, like coaching, like consulting, like doctors, right? All of these things are amazing. But you know what can help heal someone? Holding the door for them and asking them how their day is going. Smiling, right? Like these are the heroes that really are going to change the world. And we all have that ability within us, right? And But yet it starts with healing and putting down the amount, amount of stuff we're carrying along with us. And if we're able to do that, we're able to be healing for people. And because we're able to heal ourselves first. And I think that cannabis is one of many rivers, but it is a very solid river that can help us turn our shit around as a society and start realizing that we're all in this together. And not like the cheesy way that the mainstream media says, but like, we are all in this together. We are all souls having a human experience and we are so much more alike than we are different. And if we're able to realize that, then we might be able to pull our shit together soon enough to save our future for future generations, right? To save humanity for future generations. And I think that for me, you know, cannabis has been so stigmatized and so looked down upon for years that I see myself and the people that go through Kanako Cannabis and the other individuals out there doing this in their own way, like Stephen Gray, you know, these other amazing individuals that are doing this as being the protectors of this plant. You know, the same way that us as men, we protect our mothers because like they mean the world to us. Well, cannabis is a mother. And it needs protecting because it's been stigmatized and had all the shit thrown at it for years that it just does not deserve whatsoever. It's such a beautiful plant, but with great power comes great responsibility. You can't expect to interact with cannabis and have it solve all your problems for you. That's called externalizing your power. And that I think is one of the main ways that people screw themselves with this plant. And then what they do, they blame the plant. And then what happens? Bigger laws get put on it, right? And so it's just this like idea of like, guys, we need to take radical ownership of our lives and stop blaming the external circumstances for why we're not feeling happy in our lives, right? It's not cannabis that makes you lazy or makes you depressed. It's you using cannabis as a permission slip to be these things and think that you can't change your life, to be in the victim mentality. And I think that the more we work through that, the more we're going to be able to see a brighter future for ourselves. And as a result, the world around us, the important work we want to do in the world and our unique magic, because each one of us has unique magic. We have our unique set of fingerprints that has never and will never walk the face of the planet again. And so I believe our true mission here is to discover what that unique magic is. And it's literally as simple as being mm -hmm. able to smile with a Buddha smile ear to ear be able to use your voice to, you know, excite people and get them pumped up for their lives. Like it doesn't have to be this world renowned discovery that you win the Nobel prize for. Like those are amazing, but we all have the ability yeah, to unlock exactly. this unique magic. And I think that, 
you know, really what I'm all about is being the protector for this plant because, you know, I don't want to see more laws put up against it. And I know that I can help change that by showing people they're like, hey, there is a way to do this consciously and responsibly. And as a side note, real quick, I'll tell people like that three day off thing, you know, that's really the minimum, right? Like if you can take three days off per week and make sure that you're not numbing out with this plant, that is the great responsibility you take on when you interact with this plant. And like you said, there are exceptions. If you're going through cancer treatment and you want to use cannabis to help you through that, yeah, you might have to use it every day for a little while. But I have someone going through Connect with Cannabis who's about to graduate right now who moved through stage three of cancer with just using cannabis. And he realized at a certain point that he was like, hey, my cancer's gone. I'm not going to use this like this anymore. And so again, great power comes great responsibility. Love it. I love it. And that that's exactly what I was going to ask you. Uh, because uh, maybe some people still think maybe that you're, you're high right now or like you're, you're, you're no. you know, like people <laughs> tend to think that you know, people who interact with cannabis, like they do it on mm -hmm. a daily basis. What what would you say, uh, at what frequency do you use it uh, for you? Uh, yeah, so these days? It's, a, it's a great I'm question curious. because I think for a lot of people, they might not be attached to their intuition yet to be able to like understand if they're, like, they're wanting to use cannabis because of a calling or because of wanting to numb out. And so what I always tell people is start with a three day off per week. That's like your minimum. Your gold standard is interacting with it no more than two times per week. If you're someone right now who's uh dependent on it now again when you start to provide structure into your life right and you start to be like wake up to these things and understand your emotions and be more self-aware there are things you can do i'm not going to tell anyone what the exact perfect way to do it is but i can tell you from indigenous cultures the way that shamans interact with this plant is a maximum of twice per week because when you only interact with it that often it preserves the transcendental and spiritual properties and if you haven't taken a break from cannabis in a while i'd argue that you don't even know what you love about it right? Because again, if you're with your partner every second of every day, you don't know what you love about them. It's not until they go away for a while, right? Maybe they go on a retreat or something. And you're like, man, the way I cook eggs suck compared to them. Oh my God, I really miss that good morning kiss, right? Like it's in the <laughs> absence of something that your heart can grow fonder about it. And so I recommend everyone take these normal breaks from cannabis, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to serve your life in so many profound ways, because cannabis is feminine energy, we need masculine energy to take action and they dance so beautifully together. But if we're always in the feminine or always in the masculine, then we're out of balance. And so what I would say is minimum three days off per week is a great place to start. Gold standard, five days off. So how I use it is I do not use it during the weeks whatsoever because I am most prone to stress during those times. So that's where my old pattern will come up of wanting to numb out. Hmm. On the weekends, I'm able to let my structure go. I'm able to dance in the feminine, ask questions. And then that next week is when I integrate what I learned the previous weekend. And so I've been doing that for the past three years and it's been working absolutely incredible for me. And so that's what I would suggest to people who are looking to like take this and put it into action right now. Very interesting. I love the new ones that you, uh, you know, put in there because maybe for, for some people, it might be kind of like, uh, you know, binge drinking on the weekends for, for so far some people that like twice a week or once a week could be yeah, even absolutely. too much, you know? So that's why like by bringing it back to like being conscious, having an intention, it's really much harder to trick yourself. You can always, you know, trick your mind and all those things. But then again, to be unintentional and to slip into that slippery slope of your, because obviously if you have like addiction issues and all those things, well, you might want to, that's why I say consult yeah. with your health professional first. But then again, from there, uh, I think it can, as if it's not for you, if you don't like, maybe it's zero times per, yes. per year for you, but uh, you have other tools to get there. It's just yeah. one tool. That's what I, I want the listeners to understand. But um, yeah, it, it, I find it so refreshing that that message for you. And I think it's much needed for the people who interact with it, like without really knowing. And I find many, many patients also who use it a lot for like stress relief or to, for, for other things that don't really get to that root cause. And they get into that loop of needing that external mm. substance. And I'm all about, you know, like no addictions or no attachments and no aversion. So finding that balance can be tricky. So for some people, it's just to stay yes. away from it for a while. For some other people, it's to navigate with it if they can. Anyway, but yeah, I, and I'm curious also um, because I, I love how you um, walk your talk. You're uh, really into uh, 
intentions, also you're very fit. I'm curious, uh, even for the listeners, uh, what's that board? Ah, uh, dude. So <laughs> it seems to be like intentions and like very. Yeah, uh, you know, it's really interesting. So this is my vision board. And so the more things that you share in public yeah. with people, the more that you can hold yourself accountable, but also they start seeing your goals, right? And so once your basic needs are met, this is all mystery school stuff. I mean, these are just goals, but like, you know, mystery school talks about how when your basic needs are met, you're able to start actually calling in what you want. And like you were saying, like, you know, with regards to cannabis, I wanted to touch on this real quick. There'll be times where I take a month off because I get to the weekend and I realize, oh, I wanted them out with it. And so I'm like, nope, not going to use it this week. And so it's a really intuitive thing after a while. But I think starting with that structure helps. But having your goals up, right? Like I call this stuff in twice per day with my mystery school rituals. And then I also do it when I sit with cannabis and I manifest with cannabis. It's one of the things we teach in the program. And so it's so powerful to have these things up. I recommend everyone have post notes around your room, remind yourself of where you're going. And then you'll be able to stick to your structure more because you know what you're working towards. It's so powerful, man. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. And I, we had this time creative constraint, so I don't want to hold you to it uh, any longer. But where can people find you in conclusion if they want to get in touch with you, see what your, your program? I'm going to put all uh, the contact yeah. information in the show notes. But real quick, if you can tell yeah. people where they can... Uh, yeah, you can, you, and you can find me at uh, Instagram at the real Ryan Sprague, S-P-R-A-G-U-E is my last name. You can also find the business at highly.optimize, which will give you a lot of tips and tricks on how to start implementing a more conscious relationship into your cannabis paradigm. And then we also have the Ceremony Circle on Facebook, which is our free community. Come through. I'm actually going on a call right from here um, over to there, which is awesome. I'm in there giving tips. You can come talk to me. We have the Conscious Cannabis Guide that you're going to put in the show notes, I know, as well. Um, they can give you, like, if you're looking to get into our world, dive in that way. And then you can find the podcasts, uh, the Highly Optimized Podcast and the This One Time on Psychedelics Podcast on Spotify, Apple, Audible, pretty much anywhere podcasts are found. And then also, uh, if you're looking to dive into my world fully, we have the Connect with Cannabis 12-week certification program. And then we also have Grow with Cannabis coming out too. And we'll have to do a round two of this to talk more about the Grow too, because that's another huge world we didn't even get for into. Sure. So. <laughs> we'll be oh, yeah, man. So that's where you can find me. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for everything that you do. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'll speak with you uh, another time. For sure, it will be a pleasure when the other awesome. program Thanks, Max. comes out. <laughs> thank you so much. You too.